Hello and welcome back to the second episode of how to rightly divide the word of truth. And in this episode, I'm going to be looking at how to define biblical words and concepts. And the reason why this matters is that how we define and handle words in the Bible can have massive implications on doctrine and salvation. So one very good example is the definition of re repentance. What what does that mean? And One person might say, well, repentance only means a change of mind from unbelief towards belief in the gospel. Another person might say, well, no, it's much more than that. It means to turn from all of your sins in a complete transformation of character. Um, I've already done work on uh, repentance and salvation, so if you want to check that out, that's already available on my channel if you want more information about that issue particularly. So as I did in the previous video, I've set up some basic simple rules that you can follow uh, to help you divide the word of God in this manner. And so in terms of understanding biblical words and definitions, the first rule would be to look at how a word or term is used across the Bible allowing the Bible to be its its own dictionary in a sense. Sometimes as well the very first mention helps to define a word or term but, but not, not always the first mention. So picking up from that example on the previous slide about repentance. So a verse like Luke 3 3 would say that and he, referring to John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan preaching baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And so when people see the word repentance they often just interpret that as meaning turning from sin, that that's what it means. So they'll read that verse as baptism of turning from sins for the remission of sins. But sometimes sometimes turning from sin is the context of repentance. And Acts 8 is an example, as there are examples in Revelation 2 and 3. So in Acts 8, 22, it says, repent therefore of this thy wickedness. So in, in Acts chapter 8, turning from a sin or some form of wickedness is the context of the repentance. But the thing is though, not not in every circumstance. So for example, Acts chapter 19 verse 4 shows that the repentance that John preached is to believe on the coming Christ. So the re repentance is changing your mind about what you believe, not turning from your sin. So it said, and then Paul, and then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. So that's the context of repentance. It's a different kind of repentance in that particular verse. Moreover, in the King James translation, at least, and some other Reformation era Bibles, uh, there are certain verses where it actually said God repented. And this just further proves that repentance doesn't always mean turning from sins. It can have other meanings as well. Uh, modern Bibles have substituted it with other words, which, which does lead to confusion arising about the definition of that word. But again, I've done a series about repentance for salvation, if you want more information. So we can see that repentance does indeed mean a change of one's mind or a change of course. Sometimes that is of sin, like in Acts, Acts chapter 8, but, but not in every context, such as in Amos 7 and in Acts 19. So turning from sin is not always the context of repentance. There are other things that one can repent of, such as unbelief, or God may change a course of action from something he was going to do if it's based on how man behaves himself. Another example of letting the Bible be its own dictionary and looking at how a word is used is the word reprobate. Now, rather like repentance, the word reprobate is not widely used outside of, of Christian vernacular. But even within Christianity, it's not a widely used word. It's not part of our everyday uh, lingo. So uh, in Romans one twenty eight, it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And so reading Romans 1, the surrounding context may be unclear as to what exactly a reprobate mind is, other than the consequential behaviours that result from someone who's got a reprobate mind. Uh, there are also two other New Testament verses, uh, 2 Timothy 3a and Titus 1.16, which use that word, but they may not make it very obvious what, what that word means. So if you go into the Bible to the first time it's mentioned, which is in Jeremiah 6.30, it says, Reprobate silver shall men call them. Why? Because the Lord has rejected them. So this is a good verse to define this word. Men shall be called reprobate. Well, why are they called reprobate? Well, it's because, the reason being, they are rejected by God. And that would actually uh, seem to agree with the way that Romans 1 uses that word, because it's saying God gave them up. 
God gave them up, God gave them over, rejected. Okay. And if you read Second Timothy three eight, men of corrupt minds are rejected concerning the faith. So using the first appearance in the Bible as the example of how it's used in a defining term, we can use the Bible as its own dictionary. And then that gives you an idea of what it's talking about when it uses that same word in the New Testament passages. Rule number two is that you, you can use a conventional dictionary to help you, but it should be used with caution. Remember that many biblical words are seldom used in a non-religious context, so such as grace, salvation, sanctifications. And so because of this, because those words are predominantly used in Christianity, false doctrines or false views of Christianity may have actually redefined what those words mean, even in a secular dictionary. So if we were just to take some basic definitions of, of these kind of words, grace is God's unmerited favour or assistance as an act of kindness or courtesy or mercy. Justification means vindication or to have a good acceptable reason for something or behaviour, or it can also mean morally upright, like someone who's just. Similar to holy in that respect. Salvation is preservation or deliverance from a danger, destruction or difficulty or failure of some kind. A sanctification means to be set apart for a sacred or religious purpose or use. And holy means to be exalted, divine, or devoted entirely, or worthy of devotion, perfect in goodness. So they're fairly simple definitions of those words without making it remarkably complicated. But as I said, though, do use the dictionary with caution, because words have been defined, redefined because of religious interpretation, particularly of a Catholic variety, which tends to embellish and complicate what words actually mean. And we saw this with, with repentance. So if you look in the Merriam-Webster, it will say that the first definition is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. The second definition would be to feel regret or contrition or to change one's mind. And, and we saw actually that makes more sense because of how the Bible uses that word in different parts. That in, uh, definition there starts to fall apart when it says that God repented or when the repentance wasn't specifically turning of sin. So the first definition in the Merriam-Webster has been shaped by religious doggery. It's not the natural meaning of the word repent. You cannot just take the word repent on its own and then just assume it means all of that unless the surrounding context shows you that that's what it means. And again, um, refer to my video about repentance and salvation if you want more information on that topic. But this will lead me on to uh, the next rule. Actually, I'll give you two rules in, in one go here because the, these kind of tie together. So rule three and four, don't over embellish or sensationalize what words actually mean. And also don't define words by quoting other people's fanciful statements because that that's what a lot of people do with repentance and although i did cover this in a repentance video i'm going to briefly show you this again here uh, because this is actually to do with other things in the bible as well so there's this article here by this uh, kurt michelson guy and it's asking this question what does it mean to repent and his his reference verse is mark 1 15 which in full is repent you and believe the gospel. I mean, that's not even the full verse, but that, that's the key bit from the verse that he's talking about. So he's trying to explain what it means to repent in that verse. And immediately he opens the article saying, have you ever had trouble explaining what it means to repent of sin? So he's already f f forcing that definition onto it anyway, when it doesn't even say that in the verse. And then he immediately starts talking about confession, etc., etc. He then goes on to say that he's found a commentary uh, concerning this verse on another website to, to say how simple and yet profound this explanation really is. And I, I, mean, I don't know where he's getting the idea that it's simple from. But basically what he's doing is he's quoting this person to tell you what repentance is when Mark, Mark says, repent you and believe the gospel. I mean, Jesus said it, but he said it in Mark. So this is the quote. He called them to repent, not only of their former sins and vicious course of life, but their bad principles and tenets concerning a temporal kingdom of the Messiah, concerning merit and free will, justification by the works of the law, and salvation by their obedience to the ceremonies of it, and the tradition of the elders. These he exhorts them to change their sentiments about and to relinquish them, and give in to the gospel scheme, which proclaims liberty from the law, peace, pardon, and righteousness by Christ, and salvation unto eternal life by the free gift of grace of God. Now, I don't know about you, but to just say, that's your verse... And then you've got that one word and it means all of that. That's rather over sensationalized. That's rather embellished. And, and what's his justification that that word means all that? 
This article then goes on to quote another person doing the same thing. It's just that he just gives a completely different explanation as to what it is that we must lament and forsake all of our sins and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, though, folks, you can't get all of that from repent you and believe the gospel. That verse does not give you anything of that that kind of claptrap. It's not there. All we're doing is we're just defining repentance by just quoting other people's fanciful statements and in my repentance video i covered that in quite a bit of detail about how we're just quoting other preachers make these uh you know complicated statements as to what these words mean repent is not a complicated word it doesn't mean all of that claptrap okay so this is what you need to avoid don't define words by just quoting somebody's very fanciful speech tell you what it means so then when we have a verse that says, repent you and believe the gospel, this is a very short and simple statement. You, you can't get all of that fanciful definition about repentance from that verse. And they didn't even quote any other verses in the Bible. They didn't even bother to quote other verses in the Bible to show you that that's what it means. They're just making a dramatic statement and then quoting other people and then they make dramatic statements and then somebody else makes their own dramatic statement. And that's how we're defining words in the Bible. But that's not how the Bible uses words. Since the basic definition of repentance is just to change one's mind, all it really says here is change your mind and believe the gospel. This is not a proof text of a dramatic transformation of character. If a total transformation of character is what repentance really means, you need to be able to demonstrate where the Bible passage uses repentance in such a crazy, dramatic way. I can't find it, but uh, if you notice it, pop it in the uh, comments. So don't over embellish words and don't just quote other people tell you what these words mean. They're actually quite simple words that they're not that complicated. It's just that people make them complicated. The next rule that I want to talk about is to not define biblical words or terms using passages that don't specifically mention such terms unless you can establish a very, very clear connection. Now, people often do that with repentance anyway, but I'll, I'll use a different example. So let's let's take the example of being born again. All right, you ask different people what being born again means, and you'll get, you'll get all sorts. You'll get such a wide variety of answers. So one person might say, it means that you've completely surrendered your life to Christ and turned to having a relationship with him. Another person might say, it means you are a new creation of Christ with a, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 as the reference verse. Someone else might say, being born again is far more than just believing. You need to walk in obedience to God's truth for the carnal mind is enmity with God, Romans 8.7. Jesus said, go and sin no more. We need to be baptized in water, followed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, based on Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 5 and Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. So, Different people will give their own definition of uh, what being born again means. I even asked someone one time, show me in the Bible where it says, repent of your sins to be saved. And they said, well, here it says be born again. But I didn't ask where it said be born again. I asked where it said, repent of your sins to be saved. And so this is, she was defining being born again as that. And this is what you need to understand how to justify what words really mean in the Bible. So if, if we take these examples here, these answers... Okay, well, let's take the first one. This one, this answer sounds like it was made up on the spot by somebody who doesn't know the Bible very well. Okay, nowhere in the Bible does it say surrender your life to Christ. Christ died for us. We don't surrender our life to him. And even turning to having a relationship, I mean, I'm not against relationship, but the Bible never actually uses that word. It's not a prerequisite for salvation. No scriptural support was given for this answer. So it's just, someone's just got a preconceived idea of what it means, or they're just regurgitating what somebody else has said. Uh, the answer on the right, uh, you might argue this one has a lot more scriptural support. I mean, he offered more than the other two, to be fair. But the problem is that if you go to these passages, so if you go to Romans 8, 7, or if you go to Acts 1 or 2, none of those scriptural justifications actually mention being born again. Neither do they offer a clear link between the two concepts. So there's no explicit proof here that being born again has to do with any of the things that, that he's talking about. So you want to say that that means born again, but they don't say be born again in those passages. You're just making that the meaning of being born again, even if you can justify it from the Bible, right? And again, people do that with repentance. They do it with other words in the Bible as well. 
Now, you might argue that this one actually is linked to being born again, because being born, you know, implies that there's new life. The passage talks about a new life applicable to those in Christ who are no more of flesh, but it, it still doesn't mention being born again. So it's not the best proof text. And really, that answer raises more questions than it solves, because if you say, what does it mean to be born again? Oh, well, it means to be a new creature in Christ. Well, OK, what does that mean then? That, that just extends the question. It, it doesn't really answer it. So let's use the correct passage in the Bible to define what being born again means. Now, if I remember correctly, there is one other verse that mentions it other than this passage. That's in the next slide. But John chapter 3 gives us the best idea of what it means. For a start, it's a chapter that actually mentions being born again. So it's the best chapter to define what it means. So in verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, that's Nicodemus, that's who he's talking to. Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So enter the kingdom of God is synonymous with heaven or eternal life. Um, as this passage actually shows itself, even a man must be born again if he wants to enter into the kingdom. He then goes on to emphasize this. Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, so we have then, what does it mean to be born again? Well, you've already been born in the flesh or, or born of water, which is synonymous. Now, now people want to make being born of water of baptism, but there's no mention of baptism in this chapter. So Jesus is dividing the flesh from the spirit. OK, you're already born in the flesh, but and that's flesh, but you need to be born in the spirit. That's what it means to be born again. Well, how do I get born again in the spirit? Well, he tells you later in this chapter, you go further down to verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the instruction in the chapter that Jesus is talking about being born again. We've got nothing else to go on. You, you can't then make this all about a dramatic change in character and turning from all of this and going out and doing that because you can't get that from this chapter. And this is the chapter that means mentions being born again. So John 3 is the passage that actually uses the phrase. So it's the optimal passage to define what it actually means. The best definition that you can get from this passage is that a man needs to believe on Jesus Christ for everlasting life, and in doing so, he will be born in the Spirit, born again. That is its most basic definition, okay? That's actually really simple. That's not complicated at all. See how the Bible has kept the definition simple? It's only other people's explanations that have made it complicated. Now that we have this definition, we can then make links to other passages where there is a clear connection. So where it says be born again, well, there is another part of the Bible that mentions that. That's 1 Peter one twenty three. It says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. That's the born again spirit, incorruptible, which lives and abides forever. So that's perfectly consistent with John chapter 3. Uh, Galatians 4.23 also says, but he that was born, uh, sorry, he that was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. The promise, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And Galatians 4 talks about he that's born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. So again, we see the flesh, we see the spirit, just as Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3. And when it says enter the kingdom of God, so remember that John chapter 3 is defined being born again to enter the kingdom of God as believing on him uh, and having everlasting life. Well, in Matthew 21, 31, 32, Jesus is talking to some uh, chief priests and, and Pharisees, and he says, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God, there it is, before you, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and harlots believed him. Notice it didn't say they turned from all of their sins, they surrendered their life to Christ, they went out and did this, that and the other. No, they believed him because that's how you enter the kingdom of heaven according to John chapter 3. See how it's consistent there. And you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. So now that we know what it means to be born again, we can then make the connections to these other verses. But we couldn't just go to a verse and make it say that unless we can establish a clear connection. And the best way to do that is to start with a passage where it actually mentions that given term. Now, someone might bounce this back to me and say, well, hold on there, so-called no-nonsense Christianity, you manipulative little cherry picker. Jesus said we need to be born in the spirit. And Paul over and again talks about walking in the spirit and not after the flesh. And this means obeying him. So being born again obviously does mean walking in the spirit. So 
in in John 3, we have born of water, we have born of spirit, so be born of the spirit. You then go in Romans 8, and it talks about those who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. It goes on to say, they after the, that are after the spirit, mind the things of the spirit, they that are of the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. And if you go to Galatians, Paul talks about the works of the flesh and how they're manifest in all of these horrible sins over here, and that you won't inherit the kingdom of God, but then the fruit of the spirit is all of these wonderful things here. So he'll say, well, being born in the spirit means doing all of, of this stuff here that's of the spirit, right? Well, this leads me on to rule number six to answer this point for you. So rule number six is when the Bible uses analogies or parables or metaphors or idioms, try and think about the literal application of such and then whether your interpretation actually makes sense. But at the same time, though, don't do this at the expense of clear teachings. OK, so I'm going to show you this in practice. So based on that hypothetical objection that I showed in a uh, previous slide, so we have this premise, Jesus said unto Nicodemus in a conversation about eternal life and entering the kingdom of God, you must be born in the spirit. OK, now Paul said this, bearing in mind he said it to his brethren. So that, that's those who already have believed. OK, if you are led of the spirit or live in the spirit, then let you also walk in the spirit. So you must be born in the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. But Paul also goes on to say, walk in the spirit and do the things of the spirit. Right. Well, what's the literal application of these metaphors and idioms? Well, being born is a one time event in the flesh. It only happened once. So if you equate being born again as a lifetime struggle, the analogy of being born falls apart immediately. As soon as Jesus says, be born again, and it's a lifetime thing, it wouldn't make sense to be born again. He would have to say, you have to live in the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. But he said, you have to be born in the spirit. Now, walking is something that you have to gradually learn to do over a period of time with a caregiver. So in the spiritual application, that would be our heavenly father, but a caregiver to help you learn to walk, right? Now, even when learning to walk, there are other more advanced things that you will need to learn. Being led or taught by somebody who knows, or in the Christian application, again, your Heavenly Father, and sometimes you will fall and make mistakes, okay? But in conclusion, being born is the beginning of a journey. So being born again, that's the beginning of being in the Spirit. We must be born in the Spirit to enter the Kingdom of God. So being born in the Spirit then, we are then led by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, the Bible says. If we are led by the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, so if that above is true, if you are born again, if you have believed unto eternal life, let us also walk in the Spirit. But do not confuse the walking of the Spirit with what it actually means to be born in the Spirit. Okay, there's a difference between being born and walking, and that's why the Bible uses these metaphors and analogies. Moreover, we have clear proof text from John 3 that being born again is synonymous with believing in Jesus for our eternal life. We don't have clear proof text that this is the same thing as walking in the spirit and growing in the fruits thereof. So the, the term being born again only appears in two passages of the Bible. So don't turn it into something that's far more complex and profound than how Jesus actually uses this terminology himself. But with all that being said, make sure that you don't use a parable or a metaphor or an idiom or an analogy at the expense of clear teaching. So, for example, let's take the parable of the prodigal son. Well, one person might say that the parable of the prodigal son proves that you can lose your salvation because the father said, uh, my son was dead and is alive again. Uh, he was lost and is found. Someone else will say, well, no, we're saved eternally because Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and no man shall ever pluck them out of my hand. This proves that you can't lose salvation. So one's using a parable to say that you can. One's using something else to say that you can't. Well, well, who's right here? Well, this is a parable. OK, parables can be interpreted in different ways. Moreover, the very reason Jesus spoke in parables was to confound the Pharisees anyway. This here is more of a clear statement. Now, although Jesus uses a metaphor in this passage, you know, about being sheep, um, us being his sheep and him being the shepherd, he's not specifically telling a parable here. OK, so he's being quite literal about giving them eternal life. Um, and obviously he's not literally holding onto my hand. You know, there's not a hand coming from the sky, but that's the application there. It's talking about eternal life and it's a very clear teaching. A parable is not really a clear teaching if it's at the expense of clear statements like that. And not only is Jesus' statement about not letting any be plucked from his hand a clear statement, even more, even among surrounding metaphors, 
the context of the passage, John chapter 10, is that Jesus is very clearly explaining how somebody can attain eternal life and how Jesus takes on the responsibility as a shepherd to hold on to his sheep. Whereas if you actually read the parable of the prodigal son, which coincidentally is preceded uh, an analogy of, of the shepherd going out to find his sheep, similar to, to John 10, actually, the concept of giving the story, uh, sorry, the context of giving the story in Luke 15, it's about sinners coming to repentance and rejoicing when it happens. It's not specifically dealing with how to be saved or the role that Jesus takes on for those who are his. So with the parable, there's more room for interpretation and it, because the parable can be interpreted in different ways and Jesus uses it in a slightly different conversation uh, than, he, than he does in, in John 6 and 10. So go with the clear statement first and re-examine what you believe about the parable. Now, rule number seven, this is quite similar to the earlier rule about not over embellishing or sensationalizing words, but treat biblical words and terms for abstract ideas as simple words. Don't treat them as some fancy or overly profound theological or soteriological doctrinal positions. In your mind, you can subconsciously substitute those words with their abstract definitions if it helps you understand the passage. So, for example, Mark 1.15, when it says repent you and believe the gospel, if we just assume that repent is a simple word that a child could understand, it means change your mind and believe the gospel. Ephesians 2.8, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Well, grace is God's unmerited favour. So by God's unmerited favour, are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the free or unmerited gift of God. Uh, Hebrews 10.10 and 10.14, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. It then goes on to say, uh, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And so sanctified, its simple definition is to be set apart. So by the will we uh, are, which we are set apart from those whose sins are not covered through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are set apart from those who are not perfected by his offerings, you know, the, the people who are not set apart. He's setting us apart from them. So simple definitions, that's how you can read it in your mind if, if that helps it make more sense to you. And then one more example uh, in Romans 3. So when it talks about being justified, being justified freely by his grace, well, justified means uh, to give a good reason for. So being freely given a good reason by his grace, that's his unmerited favour through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, so that's a sacrificial sin offering of appeasement, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness or his right standing with God for the remission or, or the forgiveness of sins. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness or his right standing with God, that he might be just and the giver of a good reason, the provider of a good reason to him that believes in Jesus. And then it goes on to say a man is justified or given good reason for his right standing with God by faith. So the, these are simple words that they're not complicated uh, words at all. And only read these words this way in your mind if it helps you understand the passage better. But remember, the Bible should not be rewritten like on this side, though, because on paper it reads horribly. And actually, the Bible is making it simple by using a simple word to, to represent a more abstract thought, which just makes it much more readable when you can understand these words at their most basic definition. And you might wonder, well, why should I treat them as simple words? Surely these words represent more complex doctrines and ideas. Well, in Christianity, we have certain words to categorise a collection of beliefs or represent doctrinal positions on a range of issues, such as Trinity, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, pre-mid or post-tribulation rapture, antinomianism, modalism, liturgical Arminianism, Calvinism, etc., etc. Now, the, these terms are predominantly not found in the Bible. They are words that have been established by man as just a convenient shorthand to explain one's position on an issue without having to go into great detail to explain it. And if somebody didn't know what these words mean, they'd require a lot of in-depth study or an explanation about what exactly those doctrines mean. But, but they are fancy terms because we've created those fancy terms to explain certain camps of, of people's reasoning. The thing is, though, for biblical words and ideas, the Bible is not written this way. So, for example, in Paul's letters, he does not start a chapter by saying, now let me explain to you the doctrine of justification so that you will not confuse it with the doctrine of uh, salvation or sanctification. Paul and other writers, they just don't write like that. Instead, they make statements in their letters and throw in the word justification or sanctification or salvation 
with the premise that you already know what these words mean, as in any other word in your vocabulary. So, for example, when Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So, he's saying to sanctify the Lord. Well, the three chapters into the first epistle of Peter, he tells us to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. But prior to this, he hasn't explained to us the doctrine of sanctification. Moreover, there's no other letter that goes into great detail about what sanctification means in the New Testament. You can only make sense of this statement if you already understand the definition of the verb to sanctify, which which is to set apart. Just like, how do you know what the word but means? How do you know what the word the, or Lord, or God, or in, what means? These are all simple words. Well, guess what? This is a simple word as well. It's not some profound, complicated thing. It's a simple word with a simple meaning that Peter throws in there. And once you read verse 15, you're already expected to know what it means to make any sense of that verse. So the danger of treating these words as, as complex fancy words or doctrines is that you can easily obfuscate what they actually mean and cause contradictions in doctrine. So repentance was sort of one example that we touched on earlier, but let's take the word grace. So in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by grace, unmerited favour, it's a gift that's why it's not of works. But then when you read 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So in Ephesians, we say that grace, undeserved, unmerited favour of God, warrants that salvation is free. It's a free gift and works play no part of it, right? Yet in 2 Corinthians, we see that God's grace can help us to abound in works, yet works are not a part of our salvation, because if it were, that violates God's grace, according to Ephesians 2. So grace should not be treated like some mysterious force that complexly wraps together every time the word is used, but rather God's unmerited favour gives us eternal life freely, without works, but being then already saved freely, God gives us unmerited favour also for the purpose of carrying out good works and abounding therein but this should not be confused with salvation which is without works so both of those are the grace of god but not for the same purpose okay again we saw this early with the word repentance it doesn't mean turning from sin and a profound change of lifestyle every time the word is used it means different things in different parts where the word is used because it's a simple word like any other word in the bible So I hope that that helps you. If uh, anything you think I've missed or any questions you want to ask or any disagreements, pop them in the comments. But uh, when I do the next video in this series, I want to look at uh, understanding how the Bible is structured and the actual purpose for which books or passages in the Bible uh, are written. So it's understanding more the literature style of, of different books and the purpose for which different books are written.